Synonym rolls. Synonym rolls. <laughs> oh, oh, we're getting low on this. Okay. Uh, I liked it. Hi, Jeffrey. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah. I'm Gazina. Where I'm are we? Jeffrey. Oh, here you are. <laughs> and today we're going to mix up it up just a little on the isolation baking show. Usually we do something yeasted. Mm-hmm. And uh, today we're not. No, today it's going to be pasta over here. And I'm going to be making a childhood favorite, Mandelhörnchen or almond horns. That's right. But I would love for you to try to say Mandelhörnchen a thousand times at home. <laughs> My mother would be so <laughs> happy. Let alone spell it. There must be a yeah. six umlaut. There's on. an umlaut in there and it's fantastic. <laughs> so Jeffrey's going to uh, show us how to make pasta. Uh, and I'm really excited because I'm hungry. Great. And the only thing I want to do before I get started is to just give a little quick um, origin story of the Isolation Baking Show, because yep. I don't think we've explained it. It's 100% Gazina's doing that, that, that we're here every week. Um, she contacted me after she and Ray had driven three days and never saw a bag of flour in the supermarket. <laughs> and so yeah. the whole concept was hers. There's only one thing I don't like about it. What? Because it shouldn't be the isolation baking show with Jeffrey and Gazina. It should be the isolation <laughs> baking show with Gazina and Jeffrey. No, because of when I was not seeing flour, I was also not seeing yeast. And I'm like, yes, people are baking pastries and things, but I'm like, what people are really doing right now is bread. And so I'm like, they, they need Jeffrey. We can change it up every week, just like the joke <laughs> yeah, tell, okay? Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> okay, good. We won't. <laughs> Let's make pasta. Ray, if you can come close, I'm going to make a Durham pasta um, and these two bowls contain the same grain, triticum durum. Um, this is called semolina, it's very sandy. This is the same grain ground into a very powdery flour. This is my preference personally for pasta but if you only have semolina you can do it. You might have to make some slight adjustments with moisture yeah. but you should be able to do it no problem. Semolina is also a milling term, so milling is a very complex process, but in the course of making white flour from whole wheat berries, uh, in one phase the grain has been ground to about this stage, yeah. and the name of that is semolinas, plural. Semolinas. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, here we go. Here I've got Durham. Yeah, a, a couple of people wrote and they ha were really excited and ordered online what said it was Durham flour. Right. And then when it came, it said Durham semolina. Yep. Um, so that's frustrating, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's frustrating. But they can, again, they can still make it. Um, many people just use white flour for pasta. That's fine too. Uh, and you might just, need, if you use just all purpose for this, and you, yep. would you need a little more water? Involved or less? Well, what, I'm, what I want to do is um, show people the. Right. <laughs> we see ourselves. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's just about a little more water. And it's also, I find that pasta is one of those things that you have to take just a little more time to um, decide, even if you're doing the exact ratios and you have the exact ingredients you have, sometimes you do need more water. I'm going to. Um, show the texture when it's finished so that regardless of what kind of grain you're using, some people use whole grains, ancient grains, sourdough, all white flour, there's many many ways to make it and so when I'm done with the mixing of it, mm -hmm. Ray, you'll please get a good close-up so people can get a sense of what the what the texture of it is. Yeah. And actually very very often I find that um, four eggs is not enough liquid. There's right. a lot of varying absorption in grains. I should confess too that I'm not Italian. So if people think I'm an, an imposter, I apologize. And if this doesn't come out well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I might have my pay half. What's half of zero anyway? Uh, we're, we're going, yes, exactly. Uh, hey, we're so doing this out I, of the goodness of our hearts and our love of, of baking. People, a lot of people use a fork to get started. 
I'm one of those crusty old guys that tries to minimize the amount of dishes that I create and even an extra fork for whatever reason. I just get in there with my hands. You can also feel I, what's going on though. You can also see whether yeah. you've got a little hole in your um, little moat there. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So basically I'm gathering in flour from the inside of the walls and then just mushing things around with my fingers that are kind of spread out like this. The whole process of kneading is going to vary depending upon if you're doing it by hand or if you're doing it by machine. Secondly, it'll vary by how you're going to finish it because after it's mixed, it's going to relax for at least 30 minutes. I tend to give it an hour and then, <clears throat> then it gets divided into appropriate sized portions and rolled and folded, rolled and folded. And we'll see that phase happen towards the end of this program. Yeah. But for now, I just want to mix it. And the color of this is so beautiful. Yeah, it is truly beautiful. golden. Yeah. And if you use, uh, if you were to be using my hen's eggs, oh, it would boy. be bright it's orange. It would be bright you orange. You need sunglasses. Yeah. Now, if you're just joining us, Jeffrey's making pasta. The recipe is at the very top in the description of the show. So you can follow along with the recipe as he's making it. Another reason I like doing it by hand, I like the tactile environment, but secondly, I get a pretty good reading early on if it's going to be too dry. If I'm mixing it in a machine, I might not get that reading quite so early on. This is going to be too dry. I've got some water here. And you're seeing that because that I flour is not it. being absorbed and yeah, you can feel it. Yeah. I can just tell the firmness of the part that ha is hydrated um, relative to the amount of flour that's not hydrated. Yeah. It, it lets me know that I need more. It's a very firm dough. If you're tempted to add an extra egg, that might be okay, but be careful that doesn't make the dough too soft. And I've had it sometimes get too soft if I add an extra egg. So the preference is to add water rather than another egg yeah, for, so. for moisture. If you're doing a white flour pasta, it's going to take a little more, I think. If you're doing a white flour pasta, you'll probably need about one egg per 100 grams of flour. And if a large egg is 50 grams, mm -hmm. then it's about a 50% hydration. Unfortunately, the chickens don't really they don't think listen. about hydration. I've, I've talked to my chickens and yeah. they won't listen. And usually when they're yelling, the, when they're laying and they're really making a big ruckus, it ends up being the smallest egg I've ever seen. One year I said to my darling wife, Chio, I said, Chio, I think I'd like to get chickens. I can take the old shed and turn that into a chicken coop. And she got more forceful than I had ever seen her. She said, no new projects. <laughs> and now to this day, I thank her only because we can get eggs really easily in Vermont. We can get yes. them free. We can get them for three dollars a dozen. Oh, we're very and lucky. And yeah. yeah, but you have a seven day a week project. It is, but you know, once you, I've had them for, I've had both uh, chickens and waterfowl now for a very long time. And it's, it's part of my routine. Yeah, you, that's you right. feed the dogs, you feed the that's cats, right. you feed your starter and you feed the. You, that's good. That's right. Okay. So anyway, let me go back to a point that I alluded to. And that is if you're going to be after the rest phase, portioning this into, I'm going to do it into four portions and then making rolling and folding by hand, then you'd probably want to knead this further. You can knead it for a good five minutes. If on the other hand, you're going to be doing the foldings with either a hand crank pasta machine, mm -hmm, or which what I've brought today, mostly for speed, um, is one that attaches to a stand mixer. Then you don't need to knead it as much because essentially when you do the folds, that's going to Right. Basically be more it's needed. like a laminated dough. You, yeah. The actual folding will, will build so structure. So I'm going to leave this like this. Ray, come in close, please, so we can see how really firm this dough is, right? Very, very firm. 
But Jeffrey, if somebody, I'm thinking of people, for instance, who have arthritis and this kind of work is just very painful, we, they can use their mixer. Absolutely. Right. It's Absolutely. A, or even a food processor can actually. That's a good point. It, I've never it done that, but that would work, wouldn't it? It does work. The gluten is, isn't produced as well as if you were doing it by hand or in the mixer, but it does work. Uh, you'll just have to do a few more folds. That's right. But it is. Uh, I, I have noticed I have some students where I, I have different variations on making a dough based on whether it's going to be painful to do it because sometimes really getting in like that can is very painful. Yeah, I'm going to do a quick rinse in my hands and then I'm going to process. I made a dough just like I just mixed and you're going I to made it at home. It's now an hour and a half old, so it's a little old and I've done the actual folding of them so that now I can go and do the final shaping of them. Right. So Later, we're going to Later before the yeah. show is over, I'll go back to that dough that I just mixed to show you how the folding happened. So again, we're not quite in chronological order, but we never are. We never are. And again, if you're just joining us, Jeffrey's making pasta. Um, the recipe is right up there in the description so you can follow along as he's making this. And he's also noted that if you can't get the specific flowers, that are noted in the recipe, you can use other flours. You can use whole wheat, uh, you can use all white flour. The ratio of water that you might have to add may change a bit, but you can still do it. And he mixed the dough by hand. You can also do the folds and the rolling out by hand. You can do the whole process. You can do the whole process by hand. Uh, and have you ever heard of, uh, what are they called, pasta grannies? Oh yes, on YouTube. So yes, and, and if you just want to, if you decide to do this by hand, maybe just take some time and watch the pasta grannies because it, it will just, they're fantastic. They're fantastic and, and effortless. And I have not, I've only seen them do everything by hand. And they oftentimes will have one of those um, rolling pins that's as big as they are. It's as tall as yeah, they are. Yeah. It's fantastic. Okay, so I'm gonna make four different things with this pasta and I'll describe them as I go along. Um, first though, I'm going to take these pieces of dough and they've been folded eight times and they've been resting a little too long. It sh you should mix, rest the dough for 30 to 60 minutes. And what and does happen when it, it, when it rests too long? I've never let it rest too long uh, because I think to make the pasta really authentically yeah. after you've um, done the folding you go right into the final processing of the product does it get too tacky is there uh, more? i think so yeah. i think it might get too yeah. relaxed okay. okay too elastic so here we go i'm going to take these down gradually on the machine to the setting number four i'm starting with the widest setting on the machine and eventually we'll take it down to number four so the lasagna, I would go thinner. You go thinner? Since it's so many layers, yeah. Yeah. Um, and are the opening numbers the same, do you know, as the hand crank style? I believe so, yeah. 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 So that's the widest first. A lot of people will get really antsy and start on a much uh, <laughs> narrower number, and that can tear the pasta, so be patient. That's beautiful. The color is just spectacular. So You'll notice I didn't use any dusting flour. Um, right. Now I'm going to use a little because these feel a little too tacky, probably from resting a little bit too long. And you're just using AP right now to do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there's a question, can you freeze the dough? Um, and I think that you are going to say only after you've made the pasta? I've never frozen the dough, but the pasta itself, the finished shapes, freeze very, very, very well. Right. Now, if you notice the recipe... I see you stretching it as you're... I want it to be as wide as the uh, opening. If you'll notice the recipe, it says to let the pieces hang for 30 minutes. That's only true if you're going to make things like fettuccine or spaghetti or yeah. lasagna sheets. But for things that I'm going to fill, those I'm going to, as soon as they're rolled to the right thickness, 
I'm going to process them right away. Right. So you would hang the sheets before you cut them into the yeah. into the sides. Yeah. Then they get a bit of a skin. Okay, right. Now I'm going to setting number three. They cut a little more cleanly. Yep. Yeah, the question about is the type, it's confusing because there's the zero, 00 Italian flour. That would, yep. And you can use that, but it's not the Durham that you used. And that, I find that so confusing for people who are looking at all the varieties of flowers and they see something that says Italian <laughs> and the assumption is it's the one. And what number are you on now? Three. So is I'll go down one more after this one. Now, can you? Are you going to tell us what you're going to make before you do it, or is it going to be I'll a surprise? As I'm doing it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, I was an instructor at the Culinary Institute of America for two years, and there was a gifted and very, very lovely man there named Francesco, and this is his pasta recipe. I've made other types of pasta over the years, but I always come back to this one. Now, what is, what is it that you love about this one? I like the tooth. Yeah. I like the color. The color's beautiful. The versatility of pasta in general is pretty amazing, but I'm very fond of the flavor of Durham. And it does, it, it is, uh, it feels more hearty in a way, this, this Durham. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. But, it, but in no way does, does it feel overwhelming or heavy. No, no. Ray and I actually, I, I made some yesterday and oh, I, I served it with goulash. And it was lovely. Okay, so on this last pass, I'm going to then hang the sheets. So somebody just asked the question, what is the resulting difference in taste between the Durham or if you used an AP? And you just answered that without knowing the question was coming, that uh, the there's a little more tooth to using the Durham yeah. and, and has a, a more depth of flavor, I would say. Yeah. It's personal preference too. Yeah. But, you know, as you know, Gazina, aesthetics is a big part of eating. Mm -hmm. And again, we keep talking about the beautiful color, but I think that's part of it right there. Yeah. Well, it is, this is such a tactile process too. It, I find it lovely that when you're working with something for a good deal of time, to enjoy the beauty of it. Sure. As well as the feel of it. And then you get to eat it. It's, it's by no means to say that you can't make really delicious pasta with white flour. Yes, that's or true. Or whole yeah. wheat flour. That's what my mother would have done, to my chagrin. What, white? Whole wheat. Whole no, wheat. no, oh, we, wheat. we didn't yeah. have any white yeah. flour. The more, the more crumbly, the better, because she didn't quite understand the extra hydration it needed. <laughs> we had a lot of crumbly foods in my life. Okay, so the first thing we're going to make is called sacchetti. How do you spell that? S-A-C-C-H-E-T-T-I. And... What does it mean? Do you know? Yes, I do know. It means um, bags. Bags. I was about to say satchel. Yeah, exactly. So I've got an accordion cutter here. It's set for two and a half inches. You can absolutely use a pizza wheel. You can use a knife. Whatever. I gotta say, whenever I use a pizza wheel, I always go off piste. <laughs> I'm never straight. I know the feeling. Yeah, that's why I never use a pizza wheel. But a ruler and a sharp knife. Yeah. It'll, it'll take you way. places. And all these scraps, I never throw a bit of it out. Good. I'll cut these smaller or I'll keep all the pieces this size over here and all the little ones over there and just. Mm -hmm add them to a soup or whatever. But you couldn't re-roll um, them. Would you I overwork the dough? I doubt you would have success if you tried to re-roll okay. it. Here I have a filling which is comprised of ricotta cheese, mm. a bunch of grated garlic, some herbs, oregano and thyme, one egg yolk. 
Is that all from your garden? Except um, for the ricotta. <laughs> the, the herbs are, yeah, but they yeah. were dried last fall. Nice. Okay. Um, my wife makes a delicious filling where we roast in the wood stove a winter squash, like a butternut oh. squash, and then saute some finely chopped onions, maybe a little garlic, and then add the roasted squash and cook it till it really, really starts getting dry and firm. Right. And, it's a deli and actually she adds fresh mint, which is really Oh, good. mint. So usually you would find sage in something or brown butter yeah. and sage yeah. with that, but mint sounds fantastic. Yeah. So here we go with the sacchetti. I'm putting a blop of filling. That's a technical term. <laughs> plop. Notice the bag is in a completely vertical orientation. And you know that I always tell my students, piping is never as easy as you make it look or as I make it look. So take You'll your also time. notice all the pressure comes from the upper hand. There's nothing down here except this finger being kind of a guide. The guide, yeah. It's okay. not putting pressure and on And the method of assembling them is quite pretty. You take two ends. Join them. Do the same with the other two ends. Join those. Then you take the two points and join those. And you get this cute little package. So once Aww. again, join these two ends. And these two ends. Now, I noticed you didn't put any water down no, to seal them? No, because it's, again, because I didn't let it dry too long. Okay. If I had, then I would need some water. And you need, a, so I would say, huh, like two tablespoons worth of filling there? Would that sound right? Oh, golly. No, 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 no. This is... I can't really tell. I don't think it's even one tablespoon. I'm distanced. Yeah. It might be a couple teaspoons. I'm not sure. Yeah. Because you want to make you, the you, filling relative to the size of the pouch. So this is a two and a half inch wide square. And decent pressure to seal them so they don't explode. Yes, in that's, the water. that's important. If they do seem like they're dehydrating, maybe you're in a drafty place or something, then you'd want the water because otherwise when you boil them, they'll open up. I, I found something very handy for things like that when you don't want to oversaturate. Okay. I'm going to leave oh, this here now and do the next piece. So there's a mister for hair uh, people where it just there's gives a, a, a mister. So you don't squirt the water on there. It literally gives a fine mist, so you don't oh, oversaturate. Yeah, yeah, it's very work, nice. It? Let's see. We'll leave that there for now. We'll put these here. And the next one I'm going to make is called Caracoles. That comes from a really cool Spanish book that... Um, <clears throat> that was made by two Italian women whose name is the Simile sisters. They're twins, and Simile means twins, apparently, in Spanish, so that's kind of cute. This is a really fun one. And what, what does it mean? This means snails. Snails? Yeah. Oh, cool. So this one I'm going to again cut. Same width. So two and a half inches? Yep. And then I'm going to just do this from here. Okay, so now I've got four pieces. I'm going to leave about half an inch at each edge. And then I'm going to seam the whole thing. Again, use water if you're afraid that it's not going to seam well. There are hundreds and hundreds of shapes, aren't there? Yeah, there really are. Then close the ends as well. I usually go back over the top seam. 
I like to make it thinner because it looks more dramatic. These typically will bake. And I'm going to do all these and then show you how you finish them instead of starting with that first one. Do you bake them in, in a sauce? Yeah. Okay. I think you can find also the Simile Sisters on, uh, online, and they're fun too, like the pasta ladies. Yeah, the pasta grannies are pretty fabulous. Pasta grannies, yeah, that's a cool, cool show. Everyone's saying you're making it look so easy. Uh, let's reiterate that you don't want to run before you can walk. I've been making pasta for a lot of years. I'm probably a lot older than most people watching this show. So... But practice, practice. That's all. It's attainable to everybody. That's the big thing. That's one of the great things, too, about having the pasta machine. So if you, you can get really great results from it, it'll get to the right thickness. And if you just want to start with a little fettuccine, yeah. then it will cut it for you. Even the hand crank one does a great job. I That's had a hand crank one for decades and yeah. then I gave it to my son and bought I splurged. Yeah, I got, yeah, I was cranking yesterday. And we lost the clamp for okay. the table. Oh no. <laughs> it was okay. yo pasta yoga. Watch this now. This is how you finish these off. Ah, oh, cool. Is that cool or what? That so this is comes very out of this book pleasing. called Pasta Fresca. That Spanish book by those two sisters. That is. I love that. Like little. Well, it also looks like a rose. It's it does, doesn't rose. it? Yeah. And then when you bake it, because it's thinner up here, you get this really nice sort of dramatic-looking dark tip to it. Yeah, and it adds texture as well. Yeah. Is that, is the, would this be a traditional filling for this or? Uh, that, you know, in the book, um, they did a filling that had lemon, a kind of a uh. lemon cream sauce, and I've not made that. I'm not a big fan of lemon and cream, I don't think. But I think, you know, there's innumerable fillings you could do as long as they're not too fluid. Yeah. And by the way, I'm leaving all this stuff here for you guys. Hey, I'm not complaining. You all right with that, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> no complaints okay. from the peanut gallery. Now, all would you right. just leave them, if you were going to, um, say, bake them in like a half hour and, and assemble everything, would it be okay just to leave them as you have on the bench? Absolutely okay to leave okay. them right on the bench. I have found that sometimes... Um, when something is filled like this, the bottoms will, um, if you let them sit, g moisten oh, and, yeah. and sometimes stick. So I will often put, have flour down. put a little yeah. dusting down yeah. so the little tushies don't stick to the yeah, table. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, this one is, I don't know what the name would be for it, but it's something that I saw at a um, grain conference years ago, and I think it's really, really cool. So I'm cutting this out. Did you say what the size of that cutter was? That's what I'm trying to remember. Is it four inches? Wait, I... I'll bet it's four inches. I think it looks yeah, like a four. You, yeah. Okay, we'll take care of this in a little while. Here. Now I'm going to moisten... What do we got? Just under four. So it's... Like 10, you know what it is? It's 10 centimeters. Ah. Uh, no, 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 no. No, I know what you mean. Oh, I can tell you what it is. But four, four inches-ish would be... Four inches-ish. That's right. Ten. Yeah, you're right. Okay. 10 just, centimeters. Just moisten... That's just water? Yeah, outer rim. That's just water. And then... I'm going to make a little moat, leaving a little bit of a rim out here. Do I see an egg yolk in our future? You do. Oh. You sure do. <laughs> and now... This makes me very happy. 
<laughs> you put an egg yolk in the middle. Very carefully. Oops, I didn't get it big enough. Tell me if you need another egg. I got it. I got it. Oh, that's, that I didn't want to happen. No, no, so cracking, not so good? I didn't have 50-50 shell. I had like one shell was way too small. Uh. So no biggie. Okay. And then this goes in there. And then the fun part is... <clears throat> Make sure you get a good seam, and then when you boil this, you'll do it for about four minutes max. And what happens is the yolk kind of becomes sauce. So right. you want the yolk to be a little bit fluid. And it's a very rich, lovely sauce. Mm-hmm. Particularly if the eggs came from 100 feet away, right? Yeah. Okay. And you would, so best practice for cooking these, so you would put them in? Salted boiling water. Salted boiling water. Yep. And for not very long, no, right? No, not very long at all. Whoops. Yeah, this is, that is definitely one of my favorite pastas. Okay, and last but not least, I'll do a piece of fettuccine. And are you going to be doing that on the... Yeah, I'll roll yeah. that on here. So the question is, as we often get these questions, have you known of anyone to make a, a good pasta at home gluten-free? Jeez. Can you, uh, you know, I'm so uneducated on anything that's not gluten-free pastry. Yeah, I don't know the answer. I do wonder... If, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure there are recipes out there in the ether for gluten-free pasta. I hope so. We want everybody to have happy pasta memories. Yes. Okay, fettuccine. I'll take this one off and replace it with this one. I really want one of those now. So this sheet has now had some time to dry. I'd say about 10 minutes, maybe longer. So I'll cut that in half. And do you feel, the, do you feel a skin on that? There's a bit of a skin. Yeah, good. All of these can be cooked right away or they can be successfully frozen raw. They go from freezer into boiling water. They'll take longer to cook if they've been frozen but you're better off making a whole array mm -hmm. and freezing the extra. Yeah. If you are going to freeze it, I'll show you what you're going to do. Okay, so if you're going to freeze it, you'll want to have it coated in flour. So it doesn't stick to itself. Yeah, otherwise yeah. they will stick together. So you can freeze it in, you know, how many people are having dinner? Freeze it in portions that right. are big enough for two or three mm -hmm. or four or one or whatever it takes. So there we have it. Gorgeous. Okay, so we'll come back to the pasta station in order to do the folding in a while, but now we're going to go to stage right or left, depending upon your orientation. We're going to the sweet side. So I'm going to make, as I said before, Mandelhörnchen or almond horns, which were my, one of my childhood favorites. Certainly my mother's, who was a marzipan freak, uh, and these kind of fulfilled everything that she needed in her food pyramid that wasn't vegan. It includes chocolate. Um, and I, this, the recipe, if you have looked it up on the website, it calls for almond paste. I make my own almond paste, and I will tell you how I make it. Very simple. 
one cup of almond flour blanched. If you just have almonds, you can process them into a powder, and then I usually dry them out a little on a sheet pan. To that one cup of almond flour, you add half a cup of confectioner sugar, and then one egg more or less. So what I'll do is I'll put it in the food processor, and I'll blitz it, and I will whisk the egg white so it breaks up a little, or you can put it through a sieve. A pinch of salt and a little almond extract about quarter teaspoon and then you just blitz it until it comes together so that's what I consider one batch this takes a little less than three batches of that so if you don't have almond paste and you have almonds or almond flour which is now I've noticed it's pretty accessible compared to regular flour this is going to be your favorite thing ever so I'm going to start with I have my almond paste that I made it's 454 grams and that's one cup of sugar but before I do anything, I've got a little bit of egg white in here. And I'm just going to break it up a little, making it foamy. To, it will break up the egg white, so when I drizzle it in to the dough itself, it'll drizzle in more evenly. But also, it gives it some loft, right? So we're going to be creating a foamy, nice little aerated mass. I'm going to do something that is illegal. This is an illegal maneuver. Do not tell anybody I've done this because there are only two egg whites in there. I've got <laughs> illegal maneuver. Don't call the baking police. But you can actually hear the whisk now hitting the bottom. And I know you've done this at home too. So don't act like I'm doing something crazy. Just make sure when you do do this that you continue holding on to the handle because otherwise this puppy could go flying across the room. So now you've got a nice little bubble matrix in there. It doesn't have to be a meringue, right? It doesn't have to hold a peak. You just want to break it up and make it a little foamy. But it will not even get a little foamy if you have any fat in there. So I always do that first and have that ready to go. And then into the same pot without having to clean it, always a good thing, I'm going to add that cup of sugar and that almond paste that I made. If you use a commercial almond paste, which you can also do, they, it tends to be a little drier. It, it, I, that's happened so many times when you buy that little package and it is bone dry and you essentially have to rehydrate it. Well, in this case, if you make your own, it is just luscious and delicious, and I'm sure my mother would have just eaten this straight out of the food processor. So is I'm, the recipe on the site? No, but it's, it's very simple. It's the one cup of almond flour, which you can process yourself from your own almonds. Mm -hmm. I use blanched, but if you have skinned almonds, not a big deal. It will just give them a little color. Yeah. And then to that, you will add half a cup of confectioner sugar, an egg white, more or less. So you might not cool. need it all. That's why I whisk it before I put it in the processor. And you just want it to come together into a paste. If it gets too liquidy, add a little more almond flour. And then I usually add like a pinch of salt and then about a quarter to a half a teaspoon of almond extract, that bitter almond. So come look at this. We're just getting this together until... Because you know, when you say a cup of almonds, do you mean whole or they're already ground? Uh, it would be a cup of almond flour, yes. Yeah, so already, okay. already ground. So I want to make sure that this sugar is incorporated. And I want to get this from inside of my paddle because the paddle certainly likes to eat just about everything. But I really don't blame it in this occasion because this is super tasty. And now I will start it up again and slowly drizzle in those egg whites. And... I use a pastry bag to pipe this particular version. You can make this a little stiffer by adding a little more almond flour so that you can roll it essentially into a tube by hand and then cut the pieces. Uh, but I like the, t look at that, just plopping in there. Get in there. So that's two egg whites that I whisk until they were just foamy. And I'm going to, once I add them all, because you can see that it's not really incorporating because that's a really thick paste and very liquidy egg whites, I'm going to turn this puppy up after I knock this down because, 
again, it likes to eat it. When uh, one year I went to Germany, we used to go to Germany in the summers to see my family because my mother was German. And one summer I went alone. It was an adventure. I was 14. Um, and I was with my grandmother. And because Mandelhörnchen were my mother's favorite thing, and you really couldn't get them in the States, we went to the pastry shop, to the Bakerei, to the Konditorei, and we got pounds of Mandelhörnchen. And then we um, got Ziploc bags, and we uh, vacuum sealed them. And I had to hide them in my luggage. It was the best. I might also have been bringing along Nuremberger sausage and some other illegal things, and they were delicious. So now I'm going to turn this to high just to make sure everything is incorporated, and I shield myself. Yeah. And I find too, usually, there we go. This actually comes much more quickly together when I use my mother, I, the one mixer I use the most is my mother's original KitchenAid, which is the which is the Tilt Head. Um, and you have to, if you're going to start using it, it doesn't go off. It plugs in and it starts right up. But that motor will never die, and just the shape of that bowl and everything is. It, everything comes together more quickly in that because that motor is just superior and the size of that bowl, unless you're doing like a huge batch of bread, is perfect. So I also think that at that time that she bought the mixer, they allowed the actual utensils to get closer to the bowl to the, so you don't have to do as many illegal maneuvers. So here is the piping tip and bag I have. Uh, if you want to know the size, this is an Ateco 808, which is the number on there, but it, it would be called a large plain tip. You don't necessarily need a tip at all. You can just use uh, the pastry bag and just cut a bit of the pastry bag off, or if you have a reusable one, just use that and pipe it in. So I always make a little cuff for myself, and with anything, I will make sure that I place my spatula in there and I use my thumb to scrape it off. If I am making something like macaron that isn't as stiff as this, before I go in I always flick it around and then go straight in so that I don't get that tail of macaronage coming down the side and getting onto my hands. So don't overfill for a couple reasons. Um, it will just be too heavy and it'll be too hard to squeeze. The other thing is, like Jeffrey said, when you do this, you're going to be putting pressure primarily on the top of the bag, but this is pretty thick, so I will be putting some pressure on the actual um, paste itself. And when you do that, if you've got really hot hands, you tend to heat up whatever's in the bag. And I prefer not to do that. So if you put less in, you're not heating up everything as much because you're working more quickly. I also want this to be clean, so I'm going to take my bowl scraper and I flatten my pastry bag like this, and this goes for things like shoe paste, when you're making eclairs, for macaron, when as you're piping things tend to migrate up the bag, this is just a lovely way to get some control over your work environment. And now I'm going to pipe little horns. So you notice I hold my piping bag kind of parallel. And then I arc around and I stop. Boop! And you don't have to make that noise, but you can. And so that actually doesn't look so bad. Uh, sometimes at th that finish, it's not quite perfect. And so what you can do is I will freeze these after I've piped them because then you can get them a little stiffer. I don't freeze them until they're frozen, it's just about 10 minutes. And so they become, see this one, the shape is a little off, but right now because it's so loose, I won't be able to change that without really marring the actual paste. So if you put it in the freezer just to stiffen them up a bit, then you can reshape them by hand a bit. So I'll continue doing that, and then we will pretend that they went into the freezer and they look perfect, 
and you would preheat the oven to 325. These bake lickety split in about 15 to 17 minutes. Uh, gently brush with just a little more egg white and then sprinkle with sliced almonds that I break up a little more as well. If you get these really nice and stiff in the freezer, sometimes you're able to take an offset spatula and pick them up because they're so cold and stiff. And then you can have almost like a seed plate where you put them upside down into the almonds instead of, because I usually get persnickety and I can sit here for days putting almonds on there. But that way you can just put them upside down once they're really stiff into the almonds, get them coated and then put them back on. And then these would bake for about, like I said, 15 to 17 minutes. You can make them bigger too. You can make them a little stiffer and roll them by hand by putting a little more almond paste, uh, sorry, almond flour. And then once they are baked up, I melt together about a cup of bit, really nice bittersweet chocolate, and then I'll add a little bit of oil or shortening. And what that does is it creates a coating chocolate that if you, it's out of temper, it'll still look great. I also use it for um, my ice cream, like Magic Shell, uh, because it hardens the second it hits, but it doesn't get too hard. And I will take these ends, like this, and I will wiggle and I'll allow them to drip off. Now the nice thing about th these, they freeze beautifully too. Because this recipe makes quite a few. If you were me, I tend to eat all of them, but you are probably far more um, refined than I, and you will just have a few. So you can freeze them really nicely, and then just take them out of the freezer, allow them to thaw, but I have been known to eat them frozen as well. Wow. It's a problem, these things. But the lovely thing about it is that they have this lovely chew on the inside. If you were to whip that egg white even more until it was very stiff, uh, what I would then do is just add some of it to loosen up that paste. You saw how thick it was. And then you could more slowly almost fold in the rest of those egg whites to make it even more buoyant. So you can, you can change up the texture depending on how you like the final cookie, which is fun with the exact same ingredients. You can just tweak it a little to your preference. This is my favorite, a little crispy on the outside. What I would also do if I were being super traditional and fancy, I would, before I dip them in chocolate, just brush them when they're hot with some simple syrup. So that's about a cup of sugar and water melted together. Um, and then you would just brush this or a glazure or something, you know, a glaze on top, but I'm happy this way, I will eat them happily. And they just happen to be gluten-free as well, which I think is fantastic. You're so, rekindling memories. I am. Because when I owned a bakery in southern Vermont, we sold almond horns every day. Oh. And we, would, we sold so many that we would mix them in a 60-quart bowl because the batter lasts in the refrigerator. It for, does, yes. Hey, there's nothing to go wrong. And that's the other thing, is that you can refrigerate the batter, and, it's, and in this case, without having to add extra almond flour, you can refrigerate it, and it gets pretty stiff. And then you could roll it out um, into a tube and just cut your pieces instead of piping them. That's another possibility. And in that case, in order to keep it gluten-free, uh, sometimes you want to dust your bench so the stuff doesn't stick. I would use like, cornstarch something that uh, was still gluten-free. Uh, and then just cut the little pieces, shape them into horns, and then bake them as I would at 325 for about 15 to 17 minutes. Uh, but make sure that they're nice and cool before you dip them into the chocolate. Jeffrey, are you making pasta? Very soon. Yay! When you're done, I'll do the roll. I'm done. You're done? Okay. I'm done. We'll come back to the pasta station then. Now I'm going to take this dough that's been resting, I don't know, 40 minutes maybe. And I'll portion it into four pieces. Each one is gonna weigh about 180 grams. So you're getting to that place where if you're just joining us, Jeffrey has already um, shaped some pasta and then he mixed together the dough and now he's showing the folding process. And I'll just do that on one piece. But I do wanna get them all scaled. Oh, that's pretty heavy. So what are you scaling them to? 
they're going to be about 175 grams per square per, per square yep okay and then what I do is well I'll do one round in order but they're going to ultimately get several turnings I'll go a minimum of about five and sometimes I'll go up to even eight mm -hmm. right depending on how the dough feels if it seems a little bit Un, not mixed enough by hand, then I'll give it more yeah. folds. Yeah, and, and some people think that they've done something wrong, that, in the, that sometimes it will start cracking and look, it, it will be a little unsightly, yep. and they think, oh no, this is a bad batch. No, this is a continuation of that, of that mixing and kneading process. Well, watch how rough it looks after the first go through. Whoops. I didn't have it on the widest setting. <laughs> look really rough. <laughs> Poor thing. It didn't ask okay, for this. Okay, take two. Widest setting. Widest setting. There we go. There we go. Okay, normally I do all four in a row. And as one is going through the prior one, I'm folding. And you'll see how rough that looks. And then I'll fold all four of them. And then I'll say one. And then I'll do it again and say two. Now, after I've folded it, I've got two closed ends and two open ends. You always go through with the two open ends beginning and ending the process. So that, that, that's two. Open end, open end. <laughs> if this was intimidating to you, perhaps you can also do this on a slower setting. <laughs> you can do it on any setting you want. <laughs> Slow down the process. That was three. And I'd also lose count. <laughs> yeah, that's why, you have, yeah. Okay, so you get the idea. Oh, that ripped. So I probably want to use a little bit of flour now. Again, use a minimum of dusting flour, but if you need it, use it. So that's five. So what we could do now is start as we did at the very, very top of the hour and start going down in terms of the numbers so it gets thinner and, and you thinner. And you can do that right away? Yeah, yeah, you can do that right away. You can let it rest 10 minutes or so. Yeah. But depending again on the dough, but resting is not a bad idea. Resting in an hour is probably too much. Right. And the ones that I made, those rested for an hour and a half yeah. at least. Okay, Gazina, may I cook some pasta yes. for you? Yes, please, yes, okay. please. Ray, you have to work. Sorry, you'll have to wait till <laughs> the show's over. Okay, but we'll let you know how it is. Let's see. Ray, do you mind handing me that small saucepan? I can do it. And the uh, wrapped up cheese that's in it too. So these will cook in two to three minutes and they should be fine. Let me put this back in the bag. That's a lovely thing too about uh, this process is that I enjoy the, the process of making the pasta, but once you're done with it, you want it now. And yeah. that's the lovely thing is it cooks up so quickly. Right. <laughs> yep. And when it cooks, we're gonna have it with a little bit of sauce, which is some house-made pesto. Um, heat it up, the cube, we make it in the summer and then we put it in ice cube trays. Nice. And then crash them out and freeze it all winter. We don't add cheese to our pesto. Um, so I brought along some grated Parmesan to put in the sauce once I heat the sauce. Now, do you ever use non-basil green products for your pesto? Yeah, you know what I started making last year? Uh, we grow all our own garlic, and those of you who grow garlic, you know that this big curly scape forms uh, a few weeks before harvest time, mm -hmm. so early July. And they're fine steamed but they get a little boring we grow well over a hundred heads of garlic and so that's a lot of scapes yeah. to eat but i made um i made uh scape pesto and it was quite good yep i like it a lot i'm a garlicky gal too so all right so here's our little sachetti 
And so this was pesto heated up and then thinned out when it was good and hot with some heavy cream. You don't want this to boil at this point because I think it might curdle. Right. I don't know if you can hear, but my, st my stomach is rumbling. Well, come on over. I like that idea of, of freezing the little cubes of pesto. Because oh, you, yeah. you don't need a ton of pesto for each serving. Okay, Ray, here's the evidence right here that there's some for you. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the evidence that there's some pasta for you, too. Okay? Yay! Well, this is such a treat. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, it's gorgeous. Uh, bon appetit. Yeah. Itadakimasu. Or Mahlzeit, because we did something German, too. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. What are you doing next week? Well, you say what you're doing, because I'm basing what I'm doing on what you're doing. Are we allowed to eat, talk with our mouths full? I guess mm -hmm. we are. That's why I'm having you talk first, so I can <laughs> Mm, so Next good. week I'm going to make bagels. Different kind? One kind? Um, probably just one kind because I wind up making three batches throughout the week. Yeah. So I don't want to make nine batches. So I'm going to make one type of bagel. Okay. 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 So because you were making the bagel with a hole in it, I figured I'd make donuts. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Staying on theme. Yeah. So stay safe. We're here as long as you need us. Yeah. And we love doing it, though I think I'm gaining way too much weight, but that's okay. <sighs> I'll lose it later. And Come by on. the way, one, we have another minute or two before 3 o'clock. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the number of people who are now baking in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a pleasure to make bread and pastry and cake and cookies and everything. I did say that I'm baking three times a week, once right. on Wednesday to, for a test bake, then once on a dough to bring here, and then a third dough to make here, and so there's quite a lot of extra product. Mm -hmm. I've been bringing it to the local food pantry, where it's being very gratefully received, and that's one of the great, great things that bakers can do. If you bake two loaves, and if you're able to give one to somebody who's hungry or needy or even a stranger, um, it just nourishes not just them, but it nourishes you too. Mm. If you own a bakery, maybe you give 10% of your breads away at this quarantine crisis time. It'll make you feel good. You'll bring a lot of happiness. I find that bakers tend to be generous. I think so. Because oftentimes bakers bake to simply give to others, mm. which I love. So bake on, and we'll see you next week. We'll see you Thank next you. week. Thank you.